All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage, where my goal is to give you the confidence to succeed in the ICU by breaking down critical care subjects and making them easy to understand. Now, real quick, if you'd be interested in getting more critical care content such as this video here, then make sure and subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon though and select all notifications. That way you never miss out when I release a new lesson. All right, so in this lesson here, we're going to start a new series where we're looking at various labs and values that are going to be important to know when you're working with critically ill patients. So make sure and keep watching because I'm going to talk about some of the most common tests that you will see, the metabolic panels and electrolytes. All right, you guys, welcome back. Let's get started here. When critically ill patients come into the ICU, extensive testing is often gonna be performed and is gonna be necessary in order to try and diagnose what is going wrong with them. The information that we get from these tests is gonna be used to help to guide our treatment. From the time that they enter the ICU, we're frequently checking a multitude of different labs, interpreting the results, and then really modifying our treatment plans. This is essentially a staple of critical care. Now, that said, though, this practice is not without risk. Test results can be misleading and need to be taken in context with the entire picture of what's going on with the patient. Now, because of this, we want to ensure that we're testing what matters and not testing just to test. If you aren't going to treat or change your treatment plan, do we really need to check? And as a critical care nurse, you're not only going to be the one that's collecting these labs, but often the first one to see the results and make changes to the treatment plan and or notify the providers with the results when needed. Therefore, it's going to be imperative for you to know these tests, know the normal and abnormal values, and know the significance of what they mean for your patient. So with that said, let's start off talking about some of the common, most basic tests that we perform, our metabolic panels and our chemistries. Now, these are tests that we are going to send off in the green top collection tube. I actually have a really good lesson talking about the different tubes as well as the importance of the order of draw, which I'm going to link to that lesson right above here. So make sure and watch that if you haven't already. But the first thing that I actually want to talk about is going to be our metabolic panels. Now, there are two types of these panels that can be ordered, and primarily what they're looking at assessing are going to be our electrolytes, kidney function, and liver function. And these two metabolic panels are going to be our BMP, which is our basic metabolic panel, and our CMP, which is going to be our comprehensive metabolic panel. All right, so now for our BMP, this test is going to primarily be looking at our patient's electrolytes and kidney function. And this is actually going to be a collection of tests that we sort of group together in something that we call our Chem 8. And I will go further into this here in just a minute. But regarding our results for our BMP and essentially our Chem 8, I do want to talk a little bit about something that we refer to as our results skeleton. Now, you guys have probably seen this before, but this is something that you're often going to see uh, the results of these tests written in a standard form in this lab result skeleton. And what I'll do is as we go through and we talk about these different tests, I'll actually fill them in on the skeleton so you can see where they correspond. But the first column here, this is actually going to be our cations or our positively charged ions. The second column is going to be our anions or our negatively charged ions. The third column is going to be our kidney function. And then off to the right is going to be one of our results that I'll cover in just a minute. Now, as you can see, this actually makes up seven, where we talked about there being eight tests in our Chem 8. There is one test that isn't often written here, but there are variations of this that do exist. So, But this is the most common standard form that you'll see. All right, so with that out of the way, let's actually get into talking about the tests that actually make up our Chem 8. And the first one that we're going to talk about is going to be our sodium. Now, this one we're going to find at the top of our first column. Again, these are our cations, so here we're going to see our sodium. Now, normal values for sodium are going to be 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. And sodium plays an important role as a major extracellular ion that's going to be involved in maintaining serum osmolality 
and our water ion shifts between our inter and our extravascular spaces. And we are going to find this in higher concentrations in the blood than we see in our cells. So in the cases where our sodium is too high, this is something that we call hypernatremia, and this is going to be if we're greater than 145 to 150. Now some, but not all of the causes of this can be from things like excessive dehydration, either from GI or renal loss, uh, certain medications such as sodium bicarb, sodium citrate, etc. can cause this, DKA, diabetes insipidus, or Cushing syndrome. Now, symptoms are going to be primarily neurologic, so altered mental status, weakness, irritability, focal neurodeficits, possibly coma and seizures. And our treatment really involves correcting the water balance. We want to try to reduce the sodium level by 0.5 to 1 milliequivalents per hour. Now, on the flip side, when we have too little sodium, this is what we call hyponatremia, and this is when we're really generally less than 130. Now again, some of the potential causes could be things like excessive fluid intake, uh, reduced renal excretion of water, or urinary loss of sodium. This is seen with our thiazide diuretics, patients with renal failure, SIADH, congestive heart failure, and cirrhosis with ascites. Now, hyponatremic patients are often asymptomatic, but acute drops can manifest in either nausea vomiting, headache, lethargy, seizures, cerebral edema, coma, and even death. Our treatment of this involves a gradual increase in their sodium level of 0.5 milliequivalents per hour. That said, if seizures are present though, then we do want to increase this faster, uh, anywhere from 2 to 4 milliequivalents per hour. Alright, so that's our sodium. Now let's move on and talk about the next test, which is going to be our potassium. Now this one is going to go down below the sodium in our first column. And for this one, our normal values are going to be 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. And potassium plays an important role in our muscle contraction, our fluid balance, and our nerve transmission. Now this we're going to see in higher levels inside of cells than in our blood. Now potassium has an inverse relationship both with our sodium and with our patient's pH. A really good example of this that we often will see in DKA patients is as we decrease our pH, we're going to see an elevation or increase in our potassium level. Now when our patients have too much potassium, this is something that we call hyperkalemia. So our moderate is going to be 6 to 7 and severe is going to be greater than 7. Now this is most commonly seen in our patients with renal failure, but can also be due to metabolic acidosis, think of our DKA rhabdomyolysis, excessive intake, as well as Addison's. Signs and symptoms are going to include weakness, fatigue, paresthesia, respiratory failure, and ECG changes. And these ECG changes, we're going to be looking for peak T waves. So think peak T waves is hyperkalemia. And this can result in either idioventricular rhythm or even asystolic cardiac arrest. Now, if it's a mild case of hyperkalemia, then typically diuretics and K-exalate will be used. For our moderate to severe, then here we're looking at dialysis, using calcium gluconate or calcium chloride to reduce the risk of V-fib, giving them insulin and glucose to help with the cellular uptake, using alkalizing agents to increase our pH, as well as our beta-2 adrenergic medications to help with the cellular uptake. Now again, on the flip side, if our potassium is too low, this is going to be our hypokalemia, so typically if we're less than 3.5. Now common causes for this are going to be our GI losses, renal excretion, either from hyperglycemia or diuretics, alkalosis, and malnutrition. Now signs and symptoms can include, again, weakness, fatigue, paralysis, leg cramps, constipation, and respiratory difficulties. Also, more severe hypokalemia can result in ECG changes. And here you might see U waves or flattened T waves, and this can result in arrhythmias, including ventricular rhythms. Now, treatment is pretty simple and involves replacement of our potassium. All right, so let's move on to the next test, and this is going to be our calcium. Now, calcium is the one test where, if you remember earlier, I said is not actually listed in this result skeleton. Well, this is it. Now, our normal for our calcium is going to be 8.5 to 10.5 milliequivalents per liter. 
Now, calcium is actually the most abundant mineral in our body, and it plays a role in many cellular reactions and processes. So when the level's too high, this is going to be hypercalcemia, so greater than 10.5. And this is most common in patients with hyperparathyroidism. Now, moderate symptoms include depression, weakness, fatigue, and confusion. More severe symptoms include hallucinations, disorientation, hypotonicity, seizures, and coma. Levels greater than 15 can also have cardiac effects such as decreased contractility, depressed automaticity, and arrhythmias. And this can actually lead to either AV blocks and cardiac arrest. Now, our treatment usually involves saline diuresis, so we want to be watching our potassium and magnesium closely, uh, and or loop diuretics. Now, hypocalcemia is going to be when our calcium is too low, so less than 8.5. And common causes for this are going to be toxic shock syndrome, altered magnesium levels, post-thyroid surgery, and tumor lysis syndrome. Symptoms here can include paresthesia, muscle cramps, hyperreflexia, tetany, strider, and seizures. And treatment, again, is pretty simple and involves replacement with either calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. All right, on to the next test, and this is going to be our chloride. Now back to our results skeleton, this one does appear here, it's the first anion at the top. And our chloride normal is going to be from 95 to 105 milliequivalents per liter. And chloride is really key to maintaining acid-base balance, as it's inversely related to bicarb. Now when it's too high, this is going to be our hyperchloremia. Now this one is usually the result of iatrogenic chloride overload, so think our use of normal saline but it can also be from the loss of bicarb from either the GI or renal system. And this can lead to hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Now when it's too low, this is going to be our hypochloremia. And this is typically due to either GI or renal loss or hypotonic fluid dilution. And this one can actually lead to hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. And that's all I'm going to cover for chloride. Now let's actually talk about our bicarb or CO2. Now this is another anion that's going to report below chloride. And here this is actually reporting out our CO2. And our normal value is 23 to 29 milliequivalents per liter. And here our CO2 is used as a surrogate for our bicarb level. 95% of the CO2 that's measured is actually bicarb. And as you probably know, this is going to play an important role as a buffer in our acid-base balance. All right, and so from here, we're actually going to talk about the remaining test in our Chem 8. These are going to be our blood urea nitrogen, or our BUN, our creatinine, and our glucose. Now, back to our results skeleton, our BUN and creatinine are our kidney function, and our glucose is off on the side. For these tests, I'm just going to cover our normal values, so our BUN normal is going to be 6 to 20 milligrams per deciliter. For our creatinine, our normal is going to be 0.8 to 1.3 milligrams per deciliter. And glucose normal is going to be 65 to 110 milligrams per deciliter. And those conclude the eight tests that we find as a part of our Chem 8 and which also make up our BMP. Now moving on to the comprehensive metabolic panel, that this test is inclusive of all the tests from the BMP, but also includes tests to look at liver function. Now this test is much less common in the ICU than the BMP, but it does contain important information when it's needed. Now these I'm just going to list out the tests that we find on there as well as the, the normal values. And so let's actually move this up to give a little bit more room here, but the tests that we're going to find on the CMP are going to be our alkaline phosphate, aspartate transaminase, or AST, alanine transaminase, or ALT, bilirubin, total protein, and albumin. Now, normal for our alkphos is going to be 20 to 30 units per liter. Now, for both our AST and our ALT, we're looking at 5 to 30 units per liter. Our bilirubin is 0.2 to 1.9 milligrams per deciliter. Total protein, 6.3 to 7.9 grams per liter. And albumin, 3.4 to 5.4 grams per liter. All right, so that covers our BMP and our CMP, but as you can see, 
that we do have some missing electrolytes. And the first one I want to talk about is actually going to be our ionized calcium, which is going to be different than the calcium that reports as a part of the chemate or BMP. Now here real quick, our normal is going to be, depending on how you measure, either 4.5 to 5.6 milligrams per deciliter or 1.1 to 1.3 millimoles per liter. And to understand the difference between our ionized calcium and our regular calcium, it's important to know that 50% of calcium is found bound to albumin. The rest of this calcium is available in its ionized form. And so it's truly this ionized calcium that is readily available for our body to use. And so as a result of this relationship with albumin, it does have an inverse relationship with the albumin level. Next, real quick, I want to talk about our phosphorus. And our normal level here is going to be 3 to 4.5 milligrams per deciliter. And phosphorus plays a role in bones and muscle contraction. It does have an inverse relationship with calcium. We do see elevated levels in renal and liver disease, low parathyroid hormone, and hypocalcemia. We do see low levels in alcohol abuse, poor nutrition, high parathyroid hormone, and hypercalcemia. And then the final missing electrolyte that I want to talk about is actually going to be our magnesium. Now here our normal value is going to be 1.5 to 2 milliequivalents per liter. And magnesium actually plays a role in many critical reactions as it helps to transfer potassium and sodium into and out of cells. Now when our levels are too high, this is going to be our hypermagnesemia, so greater than 2.2. And this is commonly caused by renal failure. Signs and symptoms can include muscle weakness, paralysis, ataxia, drowsiness, and confusion, but it can also cause vasodilation, so severe cases can lead to hypotension, as well as bradycardia and arrhythmias, and possibly cardiac arrest. Now, treatment usually involves binding with calcium or dialysis, and then cases where magnesium is too low, this is going to be our hypomagnesemia, so less than 1.2. And this one's commonly caused by decreased absorption or increased loss from GI or kidneys, as well as T3, T4 can impact the levels. Symptoms include muscle fasciculations and tremors, tetany, ataxia, altered mental status, seizures, and arrhythmias such as torsades. And treatment for this involves our replacement. All right, so those were the missing electrolytes from our BMP and our CMP, but are important electrolytes that you are going to find yourself constantly checking. In fact, oftentimes when we're ordering a BMP, I find that we're typically adding on at least a mag and a FOSS just to ensure that we have good coverage of the different electrolytes. And so that covers the metabolic panels and electrolytes. Uh, it is important to know, too, within the green top, we do also send additional labs, such as our amylase lipase, lipid panels, our cardiac markers, as well as our ammonia. Um, but those aren't things that I specifically want to talk about here. Uh, the main thing was to focus on these metabolic panels and the electrolytes, understanding those normal values as well as some of the causes and things to be on the lookout for when our levels are too high or too low and what that really means for your patient. So I hope that you guys found this lesson useful. If you did, please leave a like down below as well as a comment. I love reading the comments that you guys leave. I try to respond to just about every single one of them. Make sure and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, as well as a huge shout out to our awesome YouTube members and Patreon supporters out there. Uh, the support that you guys offer really goes a long way in helping to provide opportunity for this channel to grow and become even more than what it is now. Now, if you'd be interested in showing support for this channel, then either join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out some of the additional perks that you get for doing just, just that. As well as you can also support this channel by checking out some of the awesome merchandise, the t-shirts uh, listed down below. And make sure and keep an eye out for the next lesson in this series. Otherwise, in the meantime, check out a couple really awesome lessons that I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.